question for you today. I have a question. Has anyone ever felt like an outsider? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of shaking of the heads. Okay, just in case you don't know what an outsi outsider is, an outsider is someone who's not fully understood or accepted into a group. That could be because of a lot of things. It could be because of the culture that we're in. Our, our backgrounds, maybe, they don't allow us to feel like we're a part, like we're the insiders. We may have struggles that prevent us from feeling like we're accepted into a group. So, again, has anyone in this room ever felt like an outsider? Okay, so if just about everyone in this room has felt like an outsider, where are all the insiders? I mean, if all of us have felt that way at some point in time, then who are the, the in-group? Who's, who's the ones who always felt that way? There's a lot of things that go into whether we feel like we belong or not. And we often feel like an outsider because we feel like we don't belong to the group that we're with. We don't feel like we belong where we are currently at for one reason or another. It could be the way that others have made us feel. You know, I know lots of people who have felt like outsiders inside of a church. The church members make others feel like an outsider. Some have felt like an outsider because of their past experiences. Maybe something they did in their, you know, we don't talk about those years of our life moments. Maybe it's something that has happened to us. Something that we had no control over, but because it happened to us, we don't feel like we belong with people. Sometimes it's just simply the way that we think of ourselves may have nothing to do with the way that others treat us, but the way that we think about ourselves, we make ourselves an outsider to the group. Whatever it is, there's many reasons for feeling like an outsider. There's many reasons why we feel like we don't belong. But I want you to realize you're in the company of other outsiders. There's not anyone here that, that is a part of an inside group that is so selective that it does not welcome you. And that's part of today's message, is realizing that the, the great invitation of the gospel, the great thing about Christianity is that all are welcome, including those who are outsiders. Those who are outliers are actually the ones that Jesus came to seek and to save. That's the whole point of a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church is that we welcome outsiders. You don't have to be a part of an inside group to, to be a part of our church. Whatever has made you feel like an outsider, God is still inviting you to join him. God's inviting you to be a part of what he is doing. But I could almost hear, and maybe you remember this moment, that moment you heard the gospel for the first time and you said, could this really be? This isn't for me. But this message is so inviting. Could this really be something I could be a part of? Something I can find my place? Well, we're going to hear a story in 2 Kings that has just that question asked. So let's, let's take a look. 2 Kings chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Elisha replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow at Samaria's, Samaria's gate, six quart of, of fine flour will sell at half an ounce of silver. Twelve quarts of barley will sell for half an ounce of silver. 
Then the captain of the king's right-hand man responded to the man of God and said, Look, even if the Lord were to make the windows of heaven, could this really happen? Elisha announced, you will in fact see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat of any of it. Now, four men with a skin disease were at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why sit here until we die? If we say, let's go into the city, we will die because there's a famine in the city. If we sit here, we will die. So now come on, let's surrender to the Arameans camp. If they let us live, we will live. If, we ki if they will kill us, we will die. I heard one, one preacher point out, but at least it will be quick. <laughs> Verse 5. So the diseased men got up at twilight to go to the Armenian camp. They came to the camp's edge and they discovered that there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean camp to hear the sounds of chariots, horses, and a large army. So the Arameans said to each other, The king of Israel must have hired the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egypt, to attack us. So they had gotten up and fled at twilight, abandoning their tents, their horses, and donkeys. The camp was intact, and they had fled for their own lives." When these diseased men came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent to eat and to drink. They picked up the silver and gold and clothes and went off and hid them. They came back and entered another tent and picked up things and hid them. Then they said to each other, we're not doing what is right. Today is a day of good news. If we are silent and we wait until morning light, our punishment will catch up with us. So let's go tell the king's household. You know, there's many stories, and I don't want to sugarcoat this in any way, but there are many stories in the Bible that are difficult to understand, even sometimes difficult to stomach. And this is one of those. We don't understand a lot of the things about the, the situation here. But that does not mean we avoid this passage of Scripture. It doesn't mean that we can't make sense of it and still get something out of it. We can't, it doesn't mean that we avoid it simply because we don't understand it. What we do is we look to God, the author of all Scripture, and understand that all of Scripture is written for our benefit and so that with the grace of God, with the Spirit of God teaching us, we can still get something out of this. We can still see God working, even in the stories that are hard to make sense of. Because when we look at this, let's go back a little bit. Let's understand some of the context. Because I know that where this started, which is part of the problem with our modern day Bible, the chapters and verses breaks are kind of in weird spots. Chapter 7 starts right in the middle of a story that actually begins in chapter 6, verse 24. Well, pastor, why didn't you go back and read that? Because I didn't. So I'll give you the summary. What we find is we find that Israel has been under siege. They've been under attack. And it has been long enough that it has caused a famine to come over the city and over the land. The enemy has attacked and they have taken everything that they could except for the actual city. And so here it is. There's the king of uh, Israel. Now, backing up. Elisha, in case you don't know, is the prophet of God to Israel. Elisha is the man of God who acts and speaks for Israel. They act, he acts and speaks the word of God to Israel and on Israel's behalf to other kings. But Elisha also likes to stir up trouble. He likes to cause things, 
His stories are some of the greatest. Like he just he just is one of those guys you would if you don't like trouble, then you would probably avoid him. If you like being in the middle of trouble, you would probably make good friends with Elisha. He He's got some stories. One time, some kids were making fun of him, and so he prayed, and all of a sudden, God took bears and started attacking those kids because they were making fun of his hairline, okay? Or lack thereof. But he likes... He likes to cause problems in a good way because every time he points back to God and he wants to draw Israel back to God. So that's his whole role. Well, there's a very vivid passage right before this that tells that during this famine, women were boiling children for food. Because the king was walking around and he heard one of the women cry out and he said, you know, being the king and being the politician that he was, what do you want me to do? He's like, there's no hope for in the, in the city, so there's no hope for you or for me right now. So what do you want me to do? Well, she was crying out because this neighboring woman convinced her to boil her child for some food. And when she went back to that woman to, you know, because it was an agreement, you boil your kid this week and I'll boil my kid next week. So when she went back to go say, okay, where's your kid? She had hid the kid to protect her own child. She was willing to let someone else make the sacrifice, but she didn't want hers. There's also a story of during this time, a donkey's head was used for soup. That is not a delicacy you want. Okay? Things were desperate. But that's not the worst. I mean, the, the boiling of the kid is, is probably the worst. The donkey's head is not so bad. But the next one is also disgusting. Because they took dove's dung for soup. I told you, some things in Scripture are hard to stomach. And this is one of them. What was happening was there's severe need. There was issues in the, the city, in the country, because of the enemy. Doesn't sound like anything happening today, does it? So this famine came on because they were under siege. The, the king of Israel was a believer in Yahweh. He was. But during this time, he started to lose faith. He started to doubt God because his own hunger was getting in the way of what was supposed to be his leading in faith. So his anger got the best of him, and he was at the breaking point. And so... Who better to, to blame things on than the man of God? So he sent a servant out to go find Elisha and hold Elisha accountable for all the trouble of Israel. So the king, despite his messed up efforts here, and despite his lack of faith, he was still looking for God to do something. In his own messed up way. He was looking for God to step in and fix things. He was waiting and he was needing God to do something. Anything. And so if God wasn't going to respond, we were going to blame the messenger of God. The servant of God. The man of God. We're going to hold him accountable. And so the king sent his messenger to Elijah to say, Why should I wait for the Lord any longer. You ever felt like that in your own life? I've been waiting for God to show up. I've been waiting for God to do something. God, I've been pleading with you. I've been begging you. I need you to do something now or never, it seems like. Well, have you ever put God into a now or never situation? It's not good for you. God's way is always going to work out. He is always going to complete his plan. His promises will always be fulfilled. But if we put God in that situation, 
mm, it's, it's not good for us. But we do. We challenge God. We, we say, God, it's now or never in my life because I'm desperate. I need you now. And then we, when God does give us the answer, because Elisha responds to, to them with hope and with good news, and he says, listen, tomorrow, and that's where we picked up our story, tomorrow the price of flour and barley will simply be, a lot of biblical experts have said, it's going to be a shekel, which was cheap compared to the ounce of silver it was already at. The price comparison is huge, okay? If you want to go back and look at historical economy and try to figure it out, God bless you, go for it. But just understand that what Elisha is saying is that right now the price is high. Tomorrow afternoon the price will be nothing. It's like if we were to say, okay, the, right now the price of gas is if you filled up your car recently, you know it's back, it's, it's high. It's not good. I remember when I got my driver's license, and some of you even remember better times, but I can only speak of my experience. When I got my driver's license, it was 95 cents a gallon. That was, if you got that, if, if today's prices, and I were to say tomorrow it will be back down to 95 cents a gallon, you'd be like, even if God opened up the windows of heaven, could that really happen? That's exactly what the king's servant, the right-hand man, asked. He's like, even if God had the windows of heaven wide open, could that really happen? How many times have we thought that? In our situation, we are so desperate. We want God to do something. But then when we hear what God's plan is, and we're like, that doesn't make sense. I mean, I have faith, but I don't have that much faith. And Elisha says, well, yeah. But because of your doubt, you, you will see it, but you won't experience it. Which is sad for that guy. But then all of a sudden, our story shifts. It's like taking a big detour. Because all of a sudden, we're on Elisha, and we're on the king's servant, and we're hearing this, this whole conversation going on, and all of a sudden, we take a, a sharp right-hand turn, and we're all of a sudden outside the city gates, and we're, we meet four lepers. Four men with skin condition. And these four lepers were the outsiders. They had no idea what was going on inside the city other than there was a famine. They, they were not privy to this conversation that we read. They had no ideas. They were outsiders. They, they are sitting there because of their condition. They were not allowed inside. They weren't allowed inside the temple, so they couldn't go and they couldn't pray and they couldn't hear the, the, the servant of God, the prophet of God speak in the temple. They weren't allowed inside the city, so they couldn't hear the king or the governor speak to the situation. They weren't even allowed in their own homes. They were outsiders, sitting outside the gate because of their condition, they were not accepted. They were not welcomed in. And the famine had hit the lepers camp as well. So they're just sitting there. These four men are sitting there. These outcasts were hungry and they're dying. And they said, why should we just sit here until we die? I mean, the, the way that they put it. If we, if we sit here we die. If we go back to the city, we die. If we go to the camp, we might die, but at least it's going to be quick. But they might let us live. There's some lessons we can learn about being an outsider with the gospel from these four lepers. First thing I want you to see is that they were desperate. 
They were desperate for God to do something. They were desperate for any sign of hope. They were desperate. And if you think back before you heard the gospel, or maybe that's where you're at today, you just realize you are desperate for God to do something, anything. And so you start weighing the, the costs and the benefits. You start thinking about the different ways that you might get out of your current situation for something that might provide a chance. See, that's what all these lepers were wanting. They were so desperate for something, they were wanting any chance at hope. But let's go through the scenarios. If we go back to the city... First of all, they had the, the, the rules of leprosy that if they were to go back into the city, they could be, first of all, they could be jailed or they could be punished. The extreme version is on the spot, they could be killed because they were, they were where they weren't supposed to be. So if they go back into the city, they might die. But even if they were left alone by the rules and, and allowed to come back into the city, what hope is there there? There's no food in there. So, if they stay there, if they just stay in their current condition, stay where they're at, there was no hope. There's no signs of relief. They're in their struggle with the leprosy. They're in their struggles with their family dynamics. They're in their struggles with everything else going on in life. And so if they just stay there, what good is that going to do? They're going to die. So let's see. If we go back here, we die. If we stay here, we die. Well, let's just risk it. Let's go to the enemy and surrender. Maybe they don't have all the same rules. Maybe they don't. Maybe they have something that our current situation doesn't have. So let's go back and let's just surrender. Church, we need to realize that when people come to a church, they are desperate. They're desperate for hope. They're desperate for any signs of life. But a lot of people, when looking at the church, that's like going back into the city because most churches don't offer hope. Most churches are struggling internally just as much as people are out ter outside the church. So why would people come to church when all they hear is about the problems with church? They see it as... If we go to church, we're going to die because it's, it's just as good or just as bad as doing what we're currently doing. At least we can go out and have our weekends because if we go to church, we have to give up Sundays, right? But when they come so desperate that they walk in here and, well, let's try it. Let's, let's at least give it a chance. They're coming because they're desperate for any signs of hope, any signs of life. That's where these four lepers were. They were so desperate for any signs. They will do anything to keep living. Our will to live is strong because God designed us to live. And so they, they risked it all. And went to the enemy's camp. What they didn't know, and this is what they discovered, is that they discovered God was already at work. God's been at work in your situation. God is still at work in your life. And if you become so desperate that you turn to God, you will see that God has been the one that's already at work and he's already provided the way of salvation. These four lepers walked in and they, they walked in and they realized the enemy had already been defeated. Could you imagine this? 
Okay, first of all, it says that they left at twilight. Right as the sun was, was going down, as it's becoming dark, and they can't see very well because they don't have modern electricity, modern lights. They don't have flashlights. They have torches. So you can't see as well. So they're thinking that if they go at night, first of all, they might be able to sneak in. Second thing is, if they are caught, maybe they won't be seen as lepers. Their, their condition won't be as evident. So they could get away with something maybe if they go in at night. So they're trying to sneak in. But as they're walking up, they're starting to see all the shields and armor just tossed about. And they see swords over here. And they see, they see people's clothing. Why is this? It, it's... It's just they, the people, the enemy, abandoned everything, left it there. And so these lepers are walking up and they're like, this is weird. Who leaves their armor laying there or a sword laying there? Who leaves good clothes just laying right there? And so they're, I'm sure they're walking up, they're like, this is a weird camp. I wouldn't want to imagine what they were thinking like, okay, are we going to come into something that we really don't want to see if all this stuff is laying on the road now? But they walk in and they walk into the first tent and they see that the enemy is gone. The enemy has already fled. The enemy is nowhere to be seen. So they walk in and they're like, this is good because there's, there's a a freshly cooked steak. There's some fresh fruit over there. Man, there's drinks already poured for us, so we're going to sit here. And we're starving, so let's eat up. Notice that when you get so desperate, you're not like the Goldilocks. You don't sit there, well, this is too hot, and this is too cold. Oh, this one's just right. See, that's what Christians do with churches. I don't like this one because this one has something I don't like. Or this one has something that, I, that I'm not comfortable with as much. Listen, if it's preaching the Bible, it's, if it's teaching the gospel, that's just right. We could deal with all the other variances, all the other variables. But if it's sticking to the word of God, sticking to the gospel... If you're desperate, you're going to take what you can get. And we need to remember that. Because there may come a time when we don't get the pleasure of picking and choosing different aspects. But we got to see that God's been that work. We got to discover God's, God's benefit and God's blessing now. That's what these lepers did. They, they came in, they discovered God was already at work. See, what we are often afraid of, what we fear, what we run from, God has already dealt with. God's already been the one at work. See, you may be struggling with sin. What you don't realize is Jesus already paid the price for all of your sin. If you just turn to him. You may be sitting there and you may be fearing what the devil is doing in your family or in your situation. You may fear Satan, but the Bible says to resist him. That means just stand up. Just, you don't have to do any fighting. If you resist the devil, he must flee. The devil has to flee from you. But if we allow him the influence, if we allow him the authority to scare us, to, to paralyze, paralyze us by fear, then he's one and he doesn't have to do anything. But the Bible tells us that if we just resist, if we say, you know what? God is bigger than you. Then Satan has to run. 
Because he already knows he's defeated. He doesn't stand a chance. What seems impossible for humans. Could this really happen? Could, even if God were to do everything that I believe God could, could he really make it to where this could happen? God says, ah, that's easy. I do that before I get my coffee in the morning. It's easy peasy because God is God. And God's already been at work. But see, then we, we see more in the story that these four lepers, not only did they, they became so desperate that they had to do something, and then they discovered that God was at work. So then when they get into this situation, they reacted. Their gut reaction was, I'm going to take everything that I can. So they reacted by, they sat down, they, they ate till they almost, I imagine they probably made themselves sick that night. Because they didn't know if this was, this was, this might be their last meal. So they're going to eat until they are completely full. And then they're going to put a little bit more in just in case. Although I remember one time after I had, I had not eaten for a long time and I decided, you know what, as soon as we're done with this, because I was, at that time, I was fasting on purpose for something. I was praying to God for something. And so once that ended, I decided, you know what? I'm, I'm going to end this fast by going out for a huge steak dinner. Because I had fasted for multiple days. And so going out for a big dinner right after you fast is not a good idea. Your stomach, your body cannot handle it. Then I realized, because the next time that I ended up fasting for praying and seeking God for something, I was like, I'm not going to make the same mistake twice because I was sick that night. I'm going to ease into this. And I had a small meal. Then I worked up to the big giant steak. But they reacted. They just they shoved as much as they could in. Then they realized, you know what? There's all this gold and silver and fine clothes sitting around, laying around. There's the armor and the swords. And so we're just going to gather everything up and we're going to store it away. We're going to pack it away and hide it so that we can be set for when our leprosy clears up, when God heals us from all this, we come in and we're so rich. A lot of new believers do this. They, they jump into the deep end, a lot of the, the Bible studies and the doctrines that it, we need to get back to the simple basics. We don't need to store stuff away in, in hopes that we become smarter and richer and more important than we ought to be. We just need to say, God, here's where I'm at, and say, and God gives us exactly what we need. But they reacted. A lot of new believers do. A lot of Christians still do. We try to keep stuff to ourselves. You know what? I'm going to store that away. I'm going to pack it away until I bring it out, and it serves my purposes. It serves my needs. It makes me look better. Listen, we don't need to store stuff. God's going to give us exactly what we need. Day by day. He's going to give us what we need for right now because a lot of times we become overwhelmed if we think about the future too much. If we look too far ahead, we won't, we won't be any good for today. So they reacted, and they hid as much as they could, but now they have a moral crisis. They come to a dilemma. They're sitting there, and they're thinking, okay, this is all great for us. We've stored up all this Bible knowledge. We've, we've stored up all these good things. We've, we've got it set, but here's the problem. 
This is not right. Something's not setting right. If we try to keep all this for us and we neglect the people that this is for, there's too much here for us to just say silent. They realized it's not right to keep this all. And so their obligation now was to share what God is doing. To share in the experience, in the joy. And that's what we need to do as a church. That's what we need to do as an individual. We need to realize if we've experienced the grace of God, the blessings of God, they're not just for us. Therefore, anybody and everybody we come in contact with. But I don't like sharing my blessings because other people get jealous. You're right. I can't control the way other people see things. I can't control that. But the reality is, it's wrong for you to keep it to yourself. I don't get jealous if God has blessed you more than he's blessed me. I rejoice because the same God that loves you loves me. And even though I may not have had that blessing right then, I know that God is faithful. And God loves me just as much as he loves you. He may show it in a different way to you than to me, but that's what you need, and I need something different. I'm not going to get jealous over it. I'm going to celebrate that the same God that we love is the one that's blessing you, and I get to see it. That's exciting for me. When God blesses each one of you, I love to hear it. True, I may have my own struggles and I may be going through something, but I won't. I'll celebrate your blessing because it's God. It's God at work. And their obligation was these treasures, these gifts, these, these supplies, the, the very thing that would save someone else's life is meant to be shared. And we need to realize that our gifts, our talents, our testimony, we're not supposed to hide them away. We're supposed to share them because it brings hope. It, it brings God into the situation. But if they stayed silent, they would die. So let's see. If we go backwards, we're going to die. If we stay where we are, we're going to die. So let's risk it and move forward. But if we keep silent about what God is doing, we're going to die. We have an obligation to share. It makes no sense. I've said that before, but looking at this story, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. The reason why the things of God don't make sense is because we're too dependent upon our senses. We live by our senses, by what we can see, by what we can understand, by what we can comprehend. Our senses are killing us. We need to stop living by our senses and start living by faith. If we were to live by faith, now, these four lepers, they had a very simple faith. They're like, we don't understand it all. We're just going to go and see. And then when they're in the moment, they're like, we don't understand it all, but we're going to start taking what we need and what we can plan for. But then we don't understand it all, but now we have too much, so we got to share it. So let's go back and tell the king. We have to have faith. What kind of faith? It's very simple. The kind of faith that believes in God. That believes God's promises. 
The promise is like this, that the one who believes in me, even if he were to die, will live. John chapter 11, verse 25. That's a promise Jesus made. The kind of promise that if that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that one. Romans chapter 10. The kind of faith that says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8. See, only outsiders really understand the grace of God. Only people who get so desperate that they need God to do something, anything, are the ones who experience his blessings and promises to its fullest. Think about the man on the cross that's hanging there, not the one who is criticizing Jesus, not the one who is, who is joining the crowds, even though he was suffering the same punishment. I didn't understand that. Like, you're in the same predicament. Why are you sitting there trying to heap on to Jesus? No, I'm talking about the guy that was sitting there and saying, and defending Jesus and saying, Jesus, I don't deserve anything. I deserve this punishment is what I deserve. But remember me. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. The guy who says, I don't deserve anything any blessing from you, but all I'm asking is that you think about me. You remember me. God, I, I understand that I'm not perfect, but God, I need you. Without you, I'm going to die. See, everyone who comes into church is desperate and needs to hear the truth of scripture. Whether you're saved or not, we're all here because we're desperate. Whether you're a church member or not, we're here because we are desperate for God. Whether you've been here a long time or you just came in the door today, we are here because we are desperate for God today. But we can't keep this to ourselves. We have to go share. Because if we keep things inside, if we keep it all to ourselves, we now are putting them as outsiders. Who are them? Anybody we come in contact with. I'm not singling out anybody, but what I'm saying is this. We often are dying on the inside because we are keeping everybody else on the outside. We push people out and make them outsiders of our own lives instead of welcoming them in to the promises and the experience of God that he has blessed us with. That's why we encourage people to be a part of small groups. That's why we encourage people to share their testimonies. We encourage people to bring someone to church because we don't want anyone to think that they're outside the grace of God. The grace of God is for all of us. So, in response to today's scriptures, we have a decision to make. You have a decision to make. And we have three options in this decision. We can go back to the way things were. However your life was, you could go back to that. You could withdraw and you can just say, you know what? That's where I'm going to die, is back where I know the way things were. But that's just it. It's going to lead to death. You can decide that you're going to just stay right here. You know what? I'm too comfortable where I'm at. The cost to move forward is too much. And I'm just, I just don't have enough conviction to actually make a move right now. So I'm just going to stay right here. You can choose to stay right here, but you, can realize, you need to realize that if you stay there too long... You're going to die. But you can choose to move forward and to do something different. To trust God, to have faith in God, to live by faith and get so desperate that every morning you wake up and say, God, I need you today. 
Because without you, I can't do anything. I can't even keep going on and keep living without you. These lepers are not the only outsiders that God has ever used. The Bible is full of outsiders learning to live by faith. We're all outsiders. And God is inviting us inside his family. Thank you for joining us for worship today. I hope and pray that God has challenged or inspired you through this message. And if he has, please leave a comment or send us an email and let us know. Also, you could do those same things to let us know if there's any prayer requests you have that we could join you in prayer for. Thank you again for watching. Hope to see you again soon. God bless you.